this is where our property is. I'm gonna just go about half a mile out. And typically whenever I'm gonna be comping to compare, you know, uh, fix and flips, I'm gonna typically stay just in the neighborhood. The reason that I'm going about half a mile out on this particular property is because all of these area, you know, these were all similar, basically the same type of style of home being built, the same type, uh, the same builder is actually three of these neighborhoods here. So they're very similar, very comparable uh, properties, because obviously when you're comping, especially if you're going to be looking to fix and flip something, you want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. You don't want to be comparing stuff that's different, different style exterior. You don't want to be comparing stuff that's two story versus single story. Like you ought to be very, this is very crucial because you make the money in the buy and you make the money in understanding what you're, you're what you're going to be comparing to. So what I like to look at is the closed properties because, you know, some people they'll, they'll I will look at active and we will look at that here in a second to see what the market is currently has available right now. Um, we'll look at pendings and come, you know, uh, the under contracts as well. I like to see what's, you know, currently under contract, kind of how long it took for those properties to sell. Um, but I always start looking at closed because active is dreamland. It's, Hey, we're in, we're in a world where we're, this is what we hope we get for it. You're, there's no actual contract on the property and closed is reality, right? Like closed are the, what you actually has sold on the market and what I'm going to be looking at comparing this to. So, so that's what we're looking at. So I'm looking at single family homes because that's what our property is detached, meaning they're not, it's not sharing a wall with another property. And then it's a single story. Uh, because when you're, again, when you're comparing single stories, you want to compare again, apples to apples, single story versus a single story, not any two stories or any, you know, basement homes, things like that, depending on the market. Some, I know markets have basements versus others. We don't typically have those in Arizona. Um, so we have square footage was 1681 square feet. So I'm typically going to go a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller on this. So we have 1681 square feet. I'm going to go about 1400 square feet and I'm going to go up to about 1900. And I'm, just so we can kind of see what's selling within a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger than ours. And then I'm also going to be looking at year build as well. So we have a 73. And this is something that you have to, you, ha you have to study your market. So whatever market you're going to be doing business in, you got to start to understand and get familiar with the different uh, types of homes that are being built and the style changes, like what year in your market does the style change, right? So for, he for Arizona, I know houses that were built pre-85 are going to be a little bit different than the homes post. A lot of the eight post-85 homes in Arizona, they have stucco, like their stucco exterior, they're built a little bit differently. And a lot of the homes pre that they're, you know, just standard kind of brick, um, brick build. So that's the things that I keep in mind and want to compare to. So I'm going to go at the max newest home up to 1985. So we cleared out a couple of those. So we have now 16 different properties. So we're going to go ahead and take a look and see what we have here. And then I, I always go to the, the highest comp because if we're going to be fixing and flipping it, we're trying to see what's the most amount of money that we're going to be able to get. Like, what does that look like? So here are the things I'm going to look at. So we have a three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet. This has no pool and we have a pool. So we already can tell this is a little bit smaller. Um, it doesn't have a pool, which, you know, ours having a pool is a value add. And this property sold in seven days. So let's let's go ahead and see what um, what type of condition this was in that it sold at. So my first thing as I'm looking through this is it's not really that remodeled. Like if we look at the kitchen, you know, the new countertops, cabinets look, you know, look OK. But when we're looking at the finishings, I mean, this is older like that. They didn't really do too much to this property. So that's the backyard. I mean, chain link side fence there. I mean, nothing, nothing really special there. Nothing too exciting. Um, so here's, here's a 375. And this was a 1960 build. It has a pool, similar square footage. So this is probably uh, relatively comparable. But let's see what it looks like inside. 
So I think we could all agree this is probably a little bit nicer than the one I just had looked at. But it's still not too crazy. I mean, bathrooms are upgraded, flooring upgraded, baseboards, has a pool, backyard, you know, it's, it's okay. It's not like they went crazy on it. it. looks like they painted the exterior. So here, here's another one here, guys, that, so this is a 3-2, 1,700 square feet, so a tad bigger than ours, and it has a pool. And it sold in less than a month. So let's go ahead and see what we got here. So this is nice. This is probably the style that we're going to go more towards. And Pace, just so you know, as far as if I don't know how well you can see on your phone, the grays and the whites, the standard stuff that we've been doing in most of our renovations lately. This is a pretty good comp, I would say. Gray, you know, grays and whites in the kitchen, nice stainless steel appliances canned lights. So end of the day, guys, um, the closed comps are all kind of in this. We, we see three at 375 that, you know, one had a pool, no pool. Right. And these are all some recent sales. Um, let's see, sold in August, sold in October. So if we're looking at this and we see that the highest sale of the three here, that wasn't even that remodeled sold at 375. If we fully remodel ours and make it really nice, I think we're going to be, you know, and this doesn't even have a garage, guys. Like we have a two-car garage. It's just a carport. So I where's think that, that where's that house on the map? How close is, is that? Um, it is like less than a quarter mile away. Nice. Okay. Neighborhood across the street. So square square footage is almost the same. Oh yeah, yeah the. The one at 375, not that remodeled, is 100 square feet smaller, no pool. And you may guys may not have this out in Arizona, but maybe you see it in other markets like Atlanta. So when I'm looking in a very urban area, how are you? So this house has a shared wall with its row house, but yet there's houses on the block behind it that are separate houses. And I'm getting a little concerned and maybe they have a parking area where this particular house does not. So people would have to find the street parking. How do you allow for all of those contingencies when you are doing the comp? For, for me, again, I, I like to just go apples to apples. So if I'm, if I'm comping and we don't have row houses here in Arizona, but if I'm comping a row house, I'm going to want to be comping against another row house. And for me, in our business, we aren't going to flip something unless we have two comps. We get, we'll flip something if we have one model match comp and there's no other comps, we'll do that. But if we don't have two comps that we can go off of, of a similar build property, we're not going to, we're not going to do the deal because it's just not in our, it's not in our risk tolerance. Like we, we don't go off of trying to set the market or set the standard for a neighborhood. We want to go into a neighborhood that there's already the standards been set. So like for us, we're not going to flip something that we can't really get a comp off of. Um, it's just, we don't have anything to go off of. So for our risk level, we're not going to touch it. Um, so if you can't find any other row houses, then I, I lean away from those because I don't have a guaranteed comp that I'm going off of that's similar style, similar build, similar amenities, similar everything that I can make a really good educated decision off of that. Now, I'm not saying it's the wrong thing, but I'm saying that you have to then make that decision of, okay, do you get an appraiser to appraise the property for you and give you what their opinion of value is? And then you guess off of that. I, we don't do that, but I know some people do make money doing that. So that, that would be my thing. Um, and you know, whether, and I don't know if you're maybe a realtor in that market, or if not, if you know a realtor that can help you establish that, but that's, that's going to be challenging if you don't have something that you can apples to apples compare that against. Yeah. So, so I'm going to look at, so like when we were looking at those closed ones, like all of those sold within about 30 days or less, typically. Um, and what I just pulled up here now, Barbara, so what I'm also looking at is I looked at, okay, what is reality, which is closed, like living in reality is living in closed sale land, like that's where you want to live. And so now I'm looking at there's a 365 here, that it's it was on the market for 75 days. So I'm already thinking why? Well, they listed it at 390. And now they're at 365. 
So I'm going to look at this. It's pending right now. It looks fixed up. It looks in fine condition. I think like this property, it took a long time to go under contract because they were probably too high. They were probably too high on their price. So that's something you're going to look at is you're looking at closed properties. You're, you look at pending. So like, I'm just looking at some of these pendings to see like, okay, like what is stuff selling for? Like is stuff, you know, trending down or trending up? So a few of these sales are lower than what we were seeing at, at closed. But I mean, look at this, this 331, this thing isn't remodeled. It's old, 10 different paint colors, ugly tile, hasn't been updated for years, kind of a messy backyard. Here's a 335, not really updated. Again, like mismatching tiles, different like carpet, older carpet. You know, one of the bathrooms is okay. So uh, some of these that are currently pending aren't really done up. And then, so to answer your question, now I'm gonna look at active. So I can see like, what's our competition? There's zero properties active, zero within half a mile. So what does that tell me? That the only properties available are already pending or under contract is stuff is selling quickly. And the fact that there's nothing active is there's not a lot of inventory here. So that's going to be good for us when we go to sell. Um, and then when we're going back to the closed, you know, we're seeing the high 300. So I would feel confident saying that with ours being all redone, that we're going to be in the, you know, conservative 380 up to 400 resale mark when we go to sell this property. In the fix and flip business, for those of you that are on here and that have actively already done some fix and flips, you already know this. And, or if you haven't, you're going to start to learn this more. Um, and for those that haven't done, you know, maybe their first fix and flip yet is there's so many factors that can really screw you up on projects. There's, there's the money costs and holding costs as you're holding the deal. There's, you know, variables like, you know, rot, like people break into some of our properties and steal our stuff out of them. And that's something that we have to account for. There's, you know, we'll have a pipe burst in a wall. Like, we'll have, like there's so many unknowns when you're fix and flipping that you're going to have to account for and stuff that just really happens when you're doing this business. And so I, some people say that I lean to be too conservative on flips, but we don't lose money on flips because I've seen it where we've done a deal where we projected to make like $40,000 and us making on the back end like $8,000 on our profit because of so many things going wrong that weren't a part of the budget. Because you don't budget for when somebody breaks in, steals your dishwasher out of your kitchen, and then the water leaks out of it for the next two days over the weekend. And now your whole kitchen that you just remodeled is flooded that now you have to go and remodel it again. Like, I'm not saying that that happens on every house, but like there, these are, there's realities when you're fixing and flipping that I think it's really important to know your numbers, know the comps that you're going after and making sure that you have room for buffer. Um, you know, we, we always add typically a 10% buffer minimum on every project because of the unknowns. You know, we had another deal that we bought and it seemed like we didn't account for having to do electrical, but as soon as we opened up one of the walls, rats were all throughout the walls and ate the electrical. So we had to redo all the electrical in the house, change order that we don't account for, but you don't know that until a wall gets opened up, right? So, um, you know, I just want to encourage you guys that you learn wherever you're going to be fixing and flipping, learn your market, understand your market, understand what sells versus what doesn't sell, understand the nuances of things that are important and having those conversations with flippers in your market that know what are the big ticket items or the big issues that come up typically in your market. So um, just want to encourage you guys to do that and become a true expert. Um, don't make this business just a hobby, treat it like a business and it'll pay you like a business. And if you treat it like a hobby, it will pay you like a hobby or worse and it'll beat you up.